a wonderful, inspired organization that is standing up for immigrant rights as human rights. And they are member sponsored, they are a grassroots organization with all the um, virtues and strengths of a real grassroots organization. And can we just give them a round of applause right now? Were trained by the US during the 80s to 
invade Nicaragua. The country where a coup d'etat took place in June of 2009, which the U.S. State Department under Secretary Hillary Clinton supported. That is my country. Honduras is also one of the most dangerous countries in the world for environmental activism. According to Global Witness, more than 120 people were killed in Honduras since 2010 for standing up to multinational companies that grab our land and trust the virus. Honduras is one of the most dangerous countries in the world for any kind of activism. And we had the high moderate, uh, moderate rates of human rights attorneys, labor leaders, and other activists to prove it. That is my country. I'm from a very poor family there. My father used his fierce pure shoes, pure shoes when he was 13 years old. I was born and raised in a very small town with no electricity, no drinking water, and sometimes no food. But when I went to high school and, and college, I formed and informed my understanding of the politics of my country. And I realized that uh, half of the population of my country was living under the same or worse conditions, extreme poverty. And that there was an economic and political system in place that was maintaining that situation. I moved to the United States uh, 30 years ago. And since then, I have been working with the Central American Immigrant Group through Central uh, This community, the Central American Immigrant Community, came to the U.S. during the 80s as a result of the civil conflict of that time. And now the Central American Immigrant Community is coming again to the United States as a result of a crisis. A crisis that had been invisible in the news coverage and also with the discussion about immigration issues. At this point, for us as Central Presenter, it's a priority, a priority to raise awareness about number one, the Central American crisis that have been invisible. There are more people dying in Central America now than during the AIDS. And this is according to the UN. Sometimes the UN is also part of the problem. But the UN is saying that more people are dying now in Central America than during the AIDS. Another thing that is a priority for us is to educate people about the legacy of the Obama administration and previous administrations. Because this crisis, the crisis did not start with Trump. Our crisis did not start with Trump. The other thing is educate people about the structural reasons behind forced migration. Because there are a lot of people in the U.S. that think that people from Central America and all other Latin American countries are coming just because family reunification of economic or economic reasons. That's not true. There are a lot of people that are coming because economic reasons and because family reunification. But most of them are coming because of violence is pushing them to leave their countries. And the other thing is also educate people about some of the major migration actions that this regime is taking right now. The new regime of Trump. Talking about the legacy of the Obama administration, for us as central presenter, it is impossible to talk about immigration without thinking about the horrible legacy of the Obama administration on the US. that have been in power are part of a political structure that have been oppressing people of color in the United States and also in the countries of Europe. Part of the legacy of the Obama administration is almost 3 million people deported, 
most of them from Latin American countries, and most of them with zero criminal convictions. That's part of the legacy of the Obama administration. The second thing that was the only good thing it was the approval of DACA, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. But we had to realize that that happened because all the work that the youth did, right? The youth were organizing. That's why I think that we need to offer the work of undocumented youth that were challenging the Obama administration at that time. That's why we were able to have DACA approved, not just because the Obama administration was the best administration, right? It's because the youth were doing a lot of organizing and resistance. They were resistant to the administration. The second thing, the third thing, is the implementation of the plan for prosperity in Central America. That is basically a recipe to continue implementing and enhancing the same economic policies that have been increasing structural poverty in our countries of origin. It's the same recipe. That's part of the plan that the Obama administration has been implemented in Central America after the crisis within a company miners in 2014. It's the same recipe. The kind of recipes that, also, that only help the elites and the corporations. The US corporations and the elites in our country's authority. It also work for ordinary people, right? So the other thing that they did is the implementation of the Mexico's Southern Border Plan. That is basically the externalization of the U.S. border and more militarization in Mexico. That is now sending more people to Central America than the U.S. with U.S. money. And the other thing that is part of the legacy of the Obama administration are the massive deportations of Central American refugees. The U.S. government, the Obama administration, was never, never able to recognize Central Americans as refugees. And in 2014, there were almost 68,000 accompanied minors coming to the U.S. without documents. What was the answer? The team and the borders. The countries like Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador that are the most dangerous places in there. That's part of the legacy. The other thing that we have been doing is talking about the structural reasons behind forced migration. For us, the structural reasons behind forced migration from Central America are structural violence, corruption and impunity, lack of employment and work opportunities, structural poverty, and the implementation. <coughs> implementation. They have been imposing these policies. Policies like the free trade agreements like NAFTA and CAP. Ooh. Structural violence. Let me tell you that structural violence is the number one reason why immigrants are coming from countries like Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador at this point. Honduras, my country, has the highest, highest homicide rate in the world. People leave because of violence, and violence is provoked by gangs, organized crime, as well as by other actors, including state actors. Corruption and impunity. Violence is connected, extremely connected, with the current highest of uh, impunity in Honduras. According to the statistics, 80%, 80% of the crimes committed in our country are not being reported to the authorities. Why? Because we don't trust our public institutions. Because they are very corrupt and inefficient. Lack of employment and work opportunities. In Honduras, labor conditions, not just in Honduras, but in other countries like Guatemala and El Salvador, labor conditions are getting worse. And uh, wages are low, and there is very uh, little job security, and very few social benefits. Structural poverty. Honduras has a population of 8.4 million people, and more than 6 million are poor. More than 6 million are poor. More, more, of the half, more of the half of the population. 
4.6 million are living in extreme poverty. Extreme poverty for the United Nations means that you're living, that a family is living on less than one dollar a day. That's extreme poverty. These conditions exist in Honduras for different reasons. We never talk about, here in the US, and usually in our country's origin too, we never talk about the role of the US government in contributing to these um, conditions through its politics and development, development programs. But I think it's important to have that conversation and understand the responsibility that the US has on these problems in the South. Otherwise, we're not going to understand why there are many people coming from the South to the North, escaping from violence and looking for opportunities. And I think that we should be doing better work there, right? And U.S. assistance uh, should be addressing root causes of forced migration and improving the living conditions of vulnerable people, reducing impunity and increasing respect for human rights. And I think that we're doing the opposite. As I said before, the U.S. government has been impassive policies like the Central American Free Trade Agreement, that, that is an expansion of NAFTA, the Central American, with Central American countries, and the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA. These policies have been destroying local economies in our countries already and forcing people to come to the U.S. or, 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 or other countries like Europe. Gender oppression. Since 2014, Central Presente have been receiving a growing number of women and children from Central America. And over the past four semesters, our organization has received and had DNA, more than 188 women from El Salvador, Honduras, and the US. And all of them, all of them, told us that they were coming to the US because of violence. And here we have been criminalizing them, criminalizing women and children that are escaping from violence. And the US government had been putting them in detention centers and treating them as criminals, right? This is not Trump. This is Obama was doing this too, right? Honduras has uh, some of the highest femicide rate in the world. According to the Center for Women's Rights in Honduras, one woman is killed every 16 hours in my country. Every 16 hours, a woman is being killed in my country. And that reality is a business. <laughs> In El Salvador, 90% of child victims of rape are girls, and 90% of the cases that are reported are punished. According to Amnesty International, more than 25,000 women leave Central America every year. This is Amnesty International saying, right? Escaping violence. In El Salvador, the female murder rate increased by 60% between 2008 and 2015, while in Honduras it rose by 37% the same um, the same period. Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras have some of the highest, highest, this is the U.S. saying again, okay, femicide rates in the world, and ra a rampant impunity fuels the crisis by, by perpetuating gender bias This is the last thing that I want to say, um, and it's about what Trump is doing now. They finished the practice called uh, capture and release. The Obama administration was releasing some people, not immigrants that were coming. So you need to have clarity about that. Too. They were releasing some people. And, uh, but now that, uh, Measure is gone. Now they are detaining people at the U.S. border and deporting them immediately. The U.S. is violating, that's a human rights crime. The U.S. is violating basic human rights of people that are here, escaping back from violence. 
about um, the presence of the U.S. in my country when I was actually a kid. Um, I was, I don't know, I think I needed the presentation. Can you help? Please. <laughs> this is my boss, name. He always helps me with interpretation because, as you can see, English is not my first language. So I would like to say something in Spanish and maybe he can help me. Dile que cuando era niño yo me acuerdo. Que cuando yo era niño yo recuerdo yendo a la escuela y que había los aviones de la compañía de ganamos. When she was a child, she remembers hearing the aircraft planes from fruit company flying red. Y yo no entendía porque porque todas las mañanas estos aviones llegaban a rociar insecticidas a los barrios más pobres que era uno de los de donde yo vivía. I didn't understand why these planes were passing overhead every morning spraying insecticides over um, fields and the adjacent neighborhoods of some of the uh, poorest neighborhoods that we lived in. Cuando era adolescente, eh, tenía que viajar de un pueblo a otro para salir de mi casa donde yo estudiaba y pasaba por un pueblo que se llama Comayagua, donde había mucho, muchos estadounidenses, mucha gente blanca. Y tampoco entendía por qué había tanto, tanto estadounidense en ese pueblo. And later when I was an adolescent, I'd be traveling from my home to the, the city where I was going to school, and you go through the city of Comayagua, and there were a lot of gringos, a lot of white people living in this area, uh, and I didn't understand why they were there. <coughs> Pero cuando fui al colegio y, y comencé a trabajar desde que yo tenía mis papers en, en una buena gente progresista, me di cuenta que había mucha gente blanca porque había una base militar estadounidense en esa ciudad. And later on when I was in uh, university and then when I was working uh, with a non-profit uh, in the North, uh, I learned that there were all these white people there because it was a large military base uh, in that town. La misma base militar eh, que fue usada para entrenar a los contras en Valero, Nicaragua en los 80 y, y cuando eh, John Neto Ponte era el embajador de Estados Unidos en mi país, que fue el responsable de muchas muertes y más de 100 desaparecidos en los años de los 80 en mi país. Uh, so, so this was the same military base, um, Bravo, the name of the that uh, is where they were training the military for the Contras, it's the base operations for that. When John Neighborpon, they we might remember that name, was the U.S. ambassador uh, in Chorus, Iran, Iraq, um, and he was responsible for whatever number she said of, of, of over 100 uh, uh, disappeared activists uh, in Doris and Spandrew. Sorry that I have to say that in that's not. Yeah, uh, so uh, I'll, I'll again be talking about some of the ways that, um, that communities across the country are making this transition, but first I'll make the, the case for why it is that we can't just tweak the, such a deeply flawed system, as Jill was saying, in terms of, you know, whether it's our healthcare system or energy system, our waste systems, the ways that we even school our children, all the ways that our, that our systems are, are really based on this, um, this notion of, of profits before people and how we, how we need to make a, a real transition into a, a, a living, shared economy that, um, that, that uplifts all rights for all people. And so yeah, we'll, um, we'll, <laughs> we'll have this, we'll be able to share this with you. Yes, that is definitely. 
and was visiting with, and it was at the time that there was this announced rollbacks around support for Alaskan villages, and we were, folks were dealing with some of the impacts there. And one of the things I learned as I was preparing for my talk there was that, for example, this red dot line alone has violated the, the, the Clean Water Act 600 times. I mean, that's just unfathomable. Like, the note, I mean, it, is, it just tells you, we're talking about rolling back already in, a, in insufficient policies. And so, and the folks who are paying the price are indigenous folks, you know, and, and so forth, disproportionately. And so, and I was in Iowa recently and found that the ag industry has caused all of these, um, these nitrates getting into the water supply and have been in with these nitrates levels and the drinking water affecting 60 cities there. And we just see uh, place after place these kind of impacts. Next slide. And so the, the, at the same time, like some of the same communities that are um, more likely to have lead in their water and all these different impacts are also being, um, being uh, separated from the resource in terms of people not you know, having their water shut off and not being able to make payments. This was in Detroit in 2014. In Baltimore last year, they had 23,000 people on the rolls to have their water cut off for not payment. Like the notion of having this, like you know, basic and essential life source. I mean, you know, life something that's essential for life cut off just because you're not able to pay. This is the very essence, you know, epitome of uh, inhumanity. Next. And so we talk about transportation and how we move ourselves, how we move goods. Next. Those, uh, these, the, the way we do transport, whether it's single car transport or you know the shipping and, and trucking and so forth and various goods and so forth, is disproportionately affecting certain communities because communities of color, low income communities are more likely to live um, and, be, and be affected by near road air pollution. Next slide. So uh, this one fifth of the United States that lives near roads with higher pollution is disproportionately comprised of people. And even our shipping channels, this is a shipping channel in, um, in Houston, Texas, where again, it's a largely Latino population, low-income populations, it's the same in Delaware, it's the same with the Petrochemical Corridor in, um, in, in Louisiana and so forth. You see the same pattern of these shipping channels being located in, in, in here in these communities. And yeah, exactly. <laughs> Next slide. And so we have these health risks that are underestimated. You don't even hear people talking about the, the health risks that and so how do these things get into our bodies? Through air pollution, through water pollution, through soil contamination, and causing all of these illnesses. For example, with African American kids are more likely to live next to a toxic facility. 71% 70, of African Americans live in, in um, counties in violation of um, air pollution standards. And a lot of people will say, when I say communities of color and low income communities, it really is that, not low income communities of color, because African American community making, uh, African American family making $50,000 a year is more likely to live next to a toxic facility than a white American family making $15,000 a year. So this is where you see that it's raised um, in, in and of itself and separate from, from income. Next slide. So this is a, a Navajo family in the Four Corners region out west um, in, uh, in, where in New Mexico. And so we visited with a number of families in, in the Four Corners region because of this impact of coal, coal in their communities. And we were doing this work in this uh, report called Cold Blooded, Putting Profits Before People. And um, found this family was gifted us with this image of themselves because that plant behind them is the Navajo generating station and is one of four coal fired power plants within a 30 mile radius of this um, community. And unfortunately, the reason that there are all these, one of the reasons that these plants were allowed to come in is because the Navajo leaders actually welcomed these plants into the area because they came with the promise of jobs. But they A, didn't come with the number of jobs that they promised, and B, they came with people in those jobs. So, um, so the people in the community didn't even benefit from the jobs. And so you, oh, sorry. So, you, so if you, you see there's no men in the image because the, even though they came with promise of jobs, the, the men who are actually raising the livelihood for the family don't even live in the community because they had to go to other states in order to, to, to earn their employment. They only get to come home every few months. They're holding a picture of someone who died of a respiratory illness. They talk about the other people in the family with respiratory illnesses. You might not be able to see, but uh, this young woman is pregnant, and they talk about the mercury that comes from those smokestacks and wonder because the mercury is known to be tied to, um, to birth defects. And so all these different ways that this family is, is, is being sacrificed, is really living in the sacrifice zone. And the ultimate injustice here, as I was talking before about the kind of uh, 
apartheid and how people have the access to it is common, is that the two coolers on their porch there to, to the right are because that's where they keep their, their food that they need to keep cold because they, like 70% of the people on this Navajo land, do not have electricity. So the coal-fired power plants, those four coal-fired power plants, they go to power Los Angeles, Las Vegas, and, um, and Phoenix. And so as you know, you can see Las Vegas from space in terms of satellite imagery because of the level of excess there. So again, it's that the excesses of the, of the few really um, resulting in um, poor economic conditions and, and life, life conditions for others. And so, and they also don't have, um, 70% of the folks on this land also don't have running water either. So again, um, and the thing there that's uh, in the same community that a lot of the water is actually used for slurry for transport of, of oil, the oil and gas. Um, you know, people might probably know more about that process than I do. But they use it for slurry to transport um, the, the oil or the gas through the pipelines there. So it's all you know just this kind of notion of even these basic resources being used for, for the and so we look at how these issues all intersect. We, um, this family sent me these two top, the pictures at the top, this young boy here, his name is Antoine, and um, his grandparents sent me this. They were late for a session that we were doing, and they said once again we had to take Antoine to the doctor because he is, you know, he's asthmatic, and he was two miles away from a coal fire power plant. And they sent me this picture of his food, but in his um, medicines that he needs in order to be able to breathe from day to day. And they sent this picture of him where, they, I don't know if you can see the little girl playing in the fountain, and they said that that's emblematic of his life, often looking on while other kids are playing, because he can't play with like other kids because of his, um, his limited lung capacity. And he's often looking out the window as other kids are going to school when he can't go to school because it's a poor air quality day and it would risk his ability to be able to breathe to go to school. And so just looking at these kind of, um, impediments to his growth, to his education, um, his access to education. And then we also think about the same stuff that's coming out of the smokestacks include lead, and then we also know that it's coming through the pipes in some of these very same communities or even in the paint in their homes. And we, and so, and lead is one of the things that leads to attention deficit disorder, attention hyperactive disorder. And so when you look at it in terms of kids not being able to go to school because of poor air quality days, they have a hard time paying attention in school because of the exposure to lead and other um, toxins. And then on top of that, you have um, under-resourced schools, because if you're living next to a toxin facility like Antoine and so many kids are, then your property values on, on average are 15% lower. And you know, we know the property values are what funds our, our educational system, and so in our schools. And so all, when you add all of that together, then what, you know, it compromises the educational attainment and possibilities of these kids. And studies show that if you're not on third on grade level by the third grade, you're more likely to enter into the school prison pipeline. And so that's why we have these images together to really show the intersectionality there of these social justice issues. Next. And so then on the other side, we know the impacts of, we know the same facilities, we have coal fire power plants, for example, are the number one contributor to, um, in terms of carbon dioxide, the greenhouse gas, and the number one greenhouse gas emissions that drive climate change. So on the other side, these very same communities are also impacted by the other side of the climate change, <coughs> from drivers to impact of climate change. So when you, one of the impacts are shifts in agricultural yields. And these very same communities that are hosting these toxic facilities and so forth are often what they call food deserts, although they don't like to be called food deserts because deserts are something that occur naturally, you know, in nature. And for them, they, know, they recognize that whether it's redlining, gentrification, urban removal, et cetera, et cetera, these are the things that separate them from these, these again, basic resources that, are, that should be in the commons. And so you have instead families that are, and children who are more likely to get their food from a corner store than a grocery store, or certainly a farmer's market. So that means that their diets are, are, are devoid of nutrients, of vitamins, of, of antioxidants, of the life-sustaining thing, and then they're full of all the things that are actively bad for us that contribute to the already existing disproportionate chronic health conditions in those communities. So foods that are heavy in preservatives, in um, sodium, and sugars, and so forth. So they're more likely to get Fritos, Doritos, or Cheetos than they are to get quinoa, quinoa, or kale. And so that's where we have these, um, 
you know, circumstances for kids that again make it even harder for them to, to have attainment because these things also uh, affect their ability to be able to, to have education attainment and so forth. And just quality of life and longevity of life. Next slide. And so, then also on the other side of the climate continuum is the disasters, the extreme weather events. So whether these kids are in ur ur urban heat islands or they're in rural areas where their housing stock is more likely to see this kind of demolition through disasters where their houses might be able to stand. These are some of the houses that we visited in Goldport, Mississippi, and Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and, and so forth, where this particular family here, the Clark family that I visited in this rural area in Alabama, they had just moved into that house eight months before this tornado came through. They didn't have, they had saved up their whole lives and, and bought the land and built the house, and literally eight months later, after they had saved up their retirement in order to move out to this area, that their, their dream was gone. They didn't have insurance, you know, because they had barely been able to scrape the money together to build the house. And um, they just literally were hunkered down in the hallway where you see the tiles there. And as they watched the roof come off the house and all of their, you know, all of their dreams just literally blown and torn asunder. Um, and so they, they only got a limited amount of money from FEMA. And so they basically have just given up on their dream of moving and of retiring in the country. They're just gonna have to go back to the city and, and rent an apartment and they're even having a man in the land because no one wants to buy the land out in this deep rural area. So again, eight months and just in a matter of moments, you know, their lifetime dream that they had saved for just went on. So then we see the intersection of the disproportionate uh, siting of these toxic facilities and communities and this impact and this um, uh, exposure to disasters. So this is a nuclear facility, the Grand Gulf Nuclear Station in um, Port Gibson, Mississippi, which is a low-income, um, uh, predominantly African-American community. And when this flooding and tornadoes happened a few years ago, there was a concern that this nuclear facility was going to be breached because the, the sirens went off, the floodwaters were rising, and the nuclear facility was really built right in the middle of this community in spite of all of their protests because they knew that there was only one road in and out. They knew that there, a lot of the um, community members didn't have transportation, and so they knew that putting them there was really putting them in harm's way. And when we have a situation where um, or even the Red Cross, who had, I went to visit there, and they had thousands of people in this place, but, and I had been up to a number of disaster, um, uh, impacted areas and see that they had this full-fledged disaster recovery center and there they just had like the Red Cross was just like at a card table in front of city halls just two of them with two chairs and we we're like what's happening here and then it turns out that they have a rule that says that they can't set up operations within seven miles of a nuclear facility so at least they have a reasonable rule but the problem is that there's homes that are that are living like you know so the problem you know so the problem is really with our zoning law and the fact that Red Cross has that rule really just kind of is the just position of like the injustice of having people in that kind of situation where Red Cross at least has the wisest to keep their workers out of harm's way. So, or the wisdom. Um, so that's uh, next slide. And so as we see the impacts of these kind of um, situations, you know, we saw with Hurricane Katrina, as Joel was saying, the people who died because they were they just weren't able to get out either because they were poor, didn't have transportation, had special health conditions, etc. Next slide. And we one little known fact is the fact that the the prisoners were abandoned, like the deputies just left when that when the hurricane was coming, left the prisoners for days, no food, no water. Sewage chain of water is rising. Um, they didn't have ventilation in their cells, so they literally had to dig through the walls to be able to breathe. Um, and so these are the kind of you know, deep marginal, deeply marginalized communities and people who, you know, no matter what their circumstances or what they say, still have the basic, the right to basic humanity. Thank you. Next slide. And then, then I, as I was uh, going around visiting the communities um, after these disasters, I was struck when I went to Huntsville, Alabama, by the fact that there were all these the folks who were giving out food, and down to a person, every last person who was giving out the food was white, and down to a person, every last person who was receiving the food was African American in this, um, in the, this meal giving um, situation. And then I went outside at that same place, next slide, and saw that every last person from local government, from FEMA, from the Red Cross, was white American, and that every last person who was lined up in the mic who needed information, who needed resources, and who needed services was African American and women. It also struck me that it was largely men on the stage. And then it also struck me that everybody who was inside getting the food in terms of African American 
uh, where, where the men, while the women were outside getting the information and getting taken care of business. So, that's a whole other presentation, but next slide. And so, also when we talk about some of the, the institutionalized disparities, um, the, Dr. Robert Bullock, who's considered to be kind of the father of environmental justice, wrote this book called The Wrong Complexion for Protection, and just talked about the ways that our, our, even our systems that are supposed to protect folks from this and that are, are set up in a way that disproportionately advantages some, not others. And this is the prime example in terms of income or, or um, finances, where after Hurricane Isaac, which was seven years after Hurricane Katrina, and they had done all this levy work in, in after Hurricane Katrina, as you know, with the Army Corps of Engineers, but this um, area called Plaquemines Parish, which is a poor parish consisting of fisher folks and oystermen and so forth, it was completely inundated after, um, after Hurricane Isaac. And so we were asking, or the CNN asked um, Senator Mary Landrieu why it was that the, the, the levy that was supposed to protect Plaquemines Parish wasn't fortified like other levies. And um, she said, she asked the Army Corps of Engineers the same question, and they said that they use a formula to decide which levies are supportive and the formula applies points to each levy based on what the economic impact would be if the levy was overtaken only. And so this is how we have this institutionalization of um, disproportionate you know, uh, lack of protection for certain communities and not others. Next slide. And so we see that uh, with sea level rise and our other impact of climate change, we have places like the Maldives, which has a sea level, a sea wall built around it, and where they actually had a cabinet meeting underwater in 2009 to illustrate internally and to the world that that's where they're going to be in 20 years, and now it's less than 15 years. And we have places in the U.S., whether it's Kivalina, Thibodeau, Louisiana, that are going to be in that same situation of displacement. We already had our first group of people who had to be moved from the Ile de Jean Charles Band of the Biloxi, Choctaw, Chittimacha um, tribe because of sea level rise. 35 people had to be moved in this community um, at the, to the tune of $40 million. And so what does that mean in terms of all the communities that are in Harmony Bay and, and what our, our real plans are around infrastructure development or plan retreat or, or whatever it is for those communities. Um, and so we see here Noah saying things like today's flood is equal to tomorrow's high tide because we're seeing floods are like thousand year floods now happening every few years, a hundred year floods happening every year and so forth. Next slide. And so when we talk about intersections, and my time is wrapping up here, and I talk about intersections of these different issues, one of the things that we um, that we talk about is how, how communities are viewed and what that means. So people might have seen these images. The same day, the Associated Press um, article um, on vote on the same day, and um, one pictures an African-American man, and it says a young man walks through chest deep flood waters after looting a grocery store in New Orleans. Um, on Tuesday, August 30th, 2005. And on the very same day, they had the white American folks, and it says two residents wade through chest deep water after finding bread and <laughs> at the local grocery store. <laughs> and so, these are the kind of um, these are the kind of uh, images and 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 and, uh, and impressions that then lead to next slide the overcriminalization of certain communities and and, and what that means. And we you know that the folks were shot on the bridge trying to escape um, from working free to African American and again being seen as criminals as opposed to people just trying to survive. And then we also have the disproportionate impact on women in different ways, whether it's the endocrine disruptors of some of the toxic facilities or the fact that women are more likely to experience violence after disasters. Um, the police blotters for domestic violence quadrupled after the BP oil during disaster. After Katrina, there were um, dozens of cases of sexual violence for, for the women after that disaster. And so when the earthquake in the about the earthquake in Haiti, the tsunami, just example after example, in the U.S. and globally of the violence that women express, experience after disaster, which is again a little discussed but well known in the whole gender justice community fact. Next slide. And then we have the fact that the U.S. is 4% of the global population with 25% of the ambition to drive climate change. And so when we talk about these kind of punitive immigration policies, then we really have to point out why it is that people need to leave their homes, what, what they're looking for as they, as they leave their homes and not just being able to provide for their family. And this next slide, this is a great um, small po poem from a Warshan Shire, a Kenyan born Somali poet. She says, you have to understand that no one puts their children in a boat unless the water is safer than the land. 
So again, it just illustrates that it's not a boring of kind of people just greedily wanting what they've got. It's people just trying to survive and, and, and help their children, their families to survive. Next slide. And so this, <laughs> even though I have multiple slides to go, it's in my time is pretty much up. We will end on uh, why it is that we're in this situation <laughs> and uh, what's driving these kind of um, the, the, our, our lack of where we need to go and um, and then the pushing in the wrong direction in terms of the, the forces that are fueling um, this exploitation domination. And so again, we didn't have time for all the solutions that I had wanted to share with you, which are about the next 50 slides or so. But um, <laughs> Maybe that, that's good because I didn't prepare for it properly for my workshop. So anyone who comes to my workshop will hear all the solutions. <laughs> I'll just show the rest of the presentation then. <laughs> so thank you very much. Eight times and uh, ten times the allowable limit. 
And so these kids, again, like the kids in Atlanta have zero percent blood. Yeah. So the kids have, you know, irreversible brain damage. And so there's unfortunately story after story really too many to tell of the impacts of uh, these environmental racism. I, I actually have a question. Um, which is, do you know of any cases of um, communities where they've gotten somebody into public office to start fighting back against environmental racism? So, a good example is, uh, is Keith Ellison, uh, who, yeah, who is really, who's done a great job in Minnesota, like institutionalizing policies that actually are, are protective and, and advancing policies around clean energy that really leads to the alternative to some of the ways that, kids, that families are, are impacted. In, um, in, in Michigan, they have a, now that one of the people who are on the Board of Education it has been um, been heavy in fighting around lead, lead exposure in kids, and now she's on the Board of Education and really fighting that fight in terms of getting lead out of the, out of the, and I was just um, at a, after the People's Climate March, I was at a Climate Hawks vote training of future, um, of, you know, of, of people who are candidates for office, and it was literally a room like this, a standing room only of all these future candidates, and so we, we provided up day long training for them, so that's, I mean, that's the, the emerging leadership that we hope will have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jackie Patterson. Shalini, one more question. One more. First of all, I want to just thank you for being here. Oh, sorry. Thank you for being here and sharing all the information that we have. And my question is, what kind of healthcare is provided or um, there is access, they can access the, uh, you know, primarily African American communities and Native American communities. Yeah, so that's the other thing, unfortunately, is the, the underinsurance the, and that obviously is in threat of being even worse um, at this point. But these very same communities are the ones that have those astronomical rates of uninsurance, and so they get their health care through, and so even with the, um, even with the asthma, a lot of times when we talk about the asthma impacts, it's like the number of emergency room visits, and that's how people are actually getting their health care. The preventative care is not really happening in so many of these very same <coughs> And so that's, and it, what struck me when I was in that same area where the, in the Four Corners region, I was in Cayenta, Arizona, and um, we were having a meeting of, uh, yeah, kind of a retreat where, where the, the theme was um, power without pollution, energy without injustice. And the irony was that the community that in Cayenta, there were a number of signs for health centers for uranium mine workers. So the fact that they actually had health centers devoted to uranium mine workers, all indigenous folks and others in that community, it, it, like a, yes, it's good that they have health care, but you know, it just like acknowledges the fact that that they need a dedicated health center because it's just known that they're gonna have these, these series of illnesses just seems wrong to me. And then uh, the last thing I'll say too is on the coal miner situation is, um, is that the, I, there's a film that, I don't think it's in here, but it, it, there's a slide that I have that shows this, um, that the, the, the interpretation of the x-rays of, 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 of a coal miner who has black lung disease by a person from Johns Hopkins University who's paid by industry, um, where he's saying, you know, this is not black lung, probably TB, you know, or some other, you know, rare, unheard of thing that doesn't happen in, in this decade, um, this century, um, and, and really uh, testifying against families who are seeking to get benefits or help for um, for their family, you know, for their family members who's impacted by black lung disease. So literally, even through the medical system and through the courts, people are being denied their rights to, to, to care. And the people who are funding that denial are the very, you know, the very employers that have benefited from the, you know, the, the labor of these folks over the years. And so it just shows just how you know, messed up the lack of health care is. The dedicated health care that acknowledges the fact that there's these illnesses based on these industries and the, the, um, the collusion of these different systems to, to deny people. Thank you. Thank you so much.